Hi, and welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. This is Dr. Sadaf Lodi, and I would love for you to leave me a review of this podcast and also to share and like it and share it with your friends, see what they think and let me know. I would love to shout you out on social media. And also, I would love for you to follow me on Instagram at Dr. Sadaf OBGYN, as well as TikTok. I also have started a YouTube channel at Dr. Sadaf Intimacy Coach. I'd love for you to follow me on all of those channels. And most importantly, I'd love for you to become a patient. I am now accepting telehealth patients for sexual health as well as menopause health in New York and Michigan. So if you are a woman that is looking for a doctor that understands you and can actually take the time to listen to all of your concerns, reach out to me. Reach out at Dr. Sadaf at drsadaf.com. And I would love to see you as a patient. And now for the episode. I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sadaf Lodi, and this episode is everything you need to know about gynecology and perimenopause and menopause and all the things in between. Before I get into it, the first thing I want to make very clear is that I'm not giving any type of medical advice. So if you're having any issues, please speak with your healthcare provider. And if you have any questions about your religion, please speak with your friendly neighborhood religious leader. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman that talks about sex. So I am so excited to have on with me today, Dr. Susie Weber. Dr. Weber is based out of Colorado, and I am going to let her introduce herself. Thank you, Sadef. Thanks for having me on today. I'm excited to have a discussion about sexual health and menopause. I'm a board certified gynecologist in the Denver area. I've been practicing for about 20 years now. I was doing OB until a couple of years ago, and now I really just focus on gynecology uh, with an emphasis on menopause and perimenopause, vulvo, vaginal disorders, and women's sexual health. So, uh, and, awesome. yeah. and I also have a web page where I've, I blog and I have a podcast and just really trying to get more unbiased information and educational resources out to perimenopausal and menopausal women to help them through that transition. So that's really been my passion the last couple of years. So I love that. I love that you focus on perimenopause and menopause, because as we know, we've that part of a woman's life has been neglected for so long. And that, you know, most women, when they're going through perimenopause and menopause, don't even know what to expect or and there's everybody is so varied, right? The type of symptoms that they have and the ailments that they go through is just so different for every woman that really there's there's really no book on it. And really there should be because I think that there are a few women that have written some books, but I think it's so important, such a neglected topic that now only recently have you know media outlets been focusing their energy on that. Yeah, it's really finally getting its heyday. And, you know, when I finished training, we were training in menopause and we were routinely prescribing hormones. We felt very comfortable with all of that. And then Women's Health Initiative came out in 2002 and then just shut everything down. And then since then, it's just been, you know, ghost town with regards to hormone education and things like that. So it's it's good to see the pendulum swinging and women getting answers and help for their symptoms finally, so. Yeah, um, you know, I would say that what happened with me during my training was that, that just like what you said, the WHI study came out and I was, I think I, I was like a second year resident and we didn't even learn how to prescribe hormones because right after that study, they said, oh no, you know, women can't go on hormones. And so I would say, you know, maybe even a few generations of OBGYNs don't know how to prescribe hormones at all because we were taught that, oh no, we're going to cause, you know, breast cancer, we're going to cause 
uh, blood clots, strokes, you know, all these problems in women, if we give them hormones that we just, everyone was so scared. And as you and I both know that uh, gynecology OBGYN is such a litigious field that everybody's so afraid, you know, and definitely no physician wants to cause any type of harm. So I think that most gynecologists are very uncomfortable prescribing hormones. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's cancer is the number one fear of most patients, women and men, and then breast cancer, of course, is such a huge concern as well. So, you know, but unfortunately, I just feel like over the last couple of decades, we've seen more and more sexual dysfunction because of that, because of women's women's reluctance to use the hormones, even when properly counseled about risks and having that fear spread to the use of local hormones as well. So, so many women have been reluctant to even use local vaginal hormones. So I just feel like that side of gynecology has exploded with more vulvovaginal issues and painful sex and decreased libido, all that stuff is so closely connected. So it's been a real shame. Yeah. So, so yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree. I think that, you know, we need to focus a lot more on uh, sexual health. And I think what happens is that along with not really learning much about menopause and perimenopause, right, we didn't learn much about sexual health either. I mean, I'm not sure about your residency, but I can definitely tell you in my residency, we didn't learn anything about sexual health. And most recently, I was at an academic institution and their, their residents didn't learn anything either. So I don't know mm -hmm. at what point um, gynecologists, urologists, or, you know, I think unless you specifically seek out sexual health. Um, you're not going to learn much. Yeah, but it'll be interesting to see if they start reintegrating more of that into residency programs because there just hasn't been any anything. I've talked to some medical students or residents and they may get one hour lecture on menopause. And so that's really a travesty considering we spend a third of our life after menopause dealing yeah. with all these things. So Absolutely. it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And I think that, you know, as more and more information uh, comes out, as more apps are developed, as more people are starting to focus on menopause, right, that women will start to get the type of treatment that they so need. So I'm interested to find out in terms of your practice, what, what are the most common complaints that women are coming to you for? Oh, gosh, well, there's a lot of them. And I think it's really the perimenopausal women that struggle the most, but definitely women after menopause as well. But I think the issues really are a little bit different. So in the perimenopause, I get the most common complaints would be mostly sleep disorder, um, hot flashes and night sweats some, to some degree, but just decreased libido, weight gain, you know, weight gain's a huge thing for a lot of women. Um, it's just not feeling good in their bodies. And then a lot of times, a lot of other kind of random symptoms that I think we're starting to learn may be in fact attributable to, attributable to these fluctuations in hormones like joint pain, pains and aches. Um, but those are the big ones. And then I would say after menopause toward the 60s, I really start to see more women who are dealing with the local lack of estrogen. So they're having issues with urinary urgency. They're having issues with vaginal dryness and pain with intercourse, and they just haven't really been able to get help from other places. So. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, one of, uh, one of the most important things as we can do as gynecologists is let women know that vaginal estrogen and mm -hmm. that local estrogen is safe for them and that it does prevent recurrent UTIs and it prevents painful sex and it'll prevent tears down in the vagina. And that, you know, as women get older, we know that that tissue down there, that skin down there gets very thin. And that it's so important to go ahead and use that vaginal estrogen. Um, you know, it's funny. I don't know if you used to hear this, but I heard in residency that, you know, oh, you don't use it, you lose it. And so I used to say that, but, you know, I'm, I'm coming to learn that that's actually really not the case. And it's, it's not the case at all. And in fact, it's really the vaginal estrogen that we need that really helps women and it doesn't matter if you know they're they're having sex or they're not having sex um you know you can always use a vaginal dilator if that becomes a problem but it's really you know the about maintenance of that tissue down in the vagina and to maintain that tissue it's really about that local vaginal estrogen 
Yeah, I agree. And I think the problem is that, and I don't know about you, maybe you see this in your practice, but you prescribe vaginal estrogen to women. They're comfortable with it. You think, okay, this is great. We have a plan. They leave the office. Then they go to the pharmacy and they pick it up and they get that box. It has the warning on it that this is, this could cause your, could cause breast cancer and stroke. And so they, I might see them back the following year and they never started the medication because of the warning on there, even though I've talked to them about that being associated with systemic hormones and not with local vaginal hormones. So it is challenging, but I agree. I think it's a combination of keeping those tissues healthy with the local vaginal estrogen. And, you know, to some degree, having sexual activity on a regular basis is going to provide some mechanical stimulation to those tissues independently as well. But man, it's, you can't get behind that if you can't tolerate the act. So I agree a lot of times the sad part is that they've been so many years without that vaginal estrogen. By the time they come in, they really have to do a lot of work to get back to the sexual function that they want to get back to. And that's where sometimes I think it's, it's challenging because once you have to start using, thinking about dilators and doing all that, it's a lot. (laughs) So it is. is. Yeah. You're right. And absolutely with, um, you know, with frequent intercourse, there is definitely increased tissue, increased blood supply, right, to that general area, which then of yeah. course helps with the tissue and will keep that tissue nice and, you know, firm and as opposed to very thin. And of course, that vaginal estrogen is really going to help as well with that tissue. So I think both of those things together will really be very helpful. You had mentioned that, you know, a lot of women in perimenopause have so many different symptoms. Is there one symptom that tends to stand out to you that you said you mentioned sleep? Um, Do you find that women that go on hormones actually result in better sleep? A lot of times. I don't feel like it's 100% of a fix for everyone, but I feel like they do find some improvement. Um, you know, certainly if they're having the hot flashes and night sweats and they're waking up multiple times at night, the es- if they're taking estrogen, that's going to help progesterone. If they have a uterus, that progesterone, if they're taking that is going to help probably with calming and may help some with sleep. But the challenge I think that I see in most perimenopausal women is not so much falling asleep, but waking up early in the morning and just having difficult time getting back to sleep for an hour or two hours. And then by the time they do settle back into sleep, you know, it's time to get up and go to work or start their day. And and that really just creates so many issues with fatigue and mood. And of course that parlays into decreased libido. And I think weight gain, it's all, it's all connected. And that's really the frustrating part for me as a practitioner, as we, you know, and probably for you too, we want to help these women, um, but there's no real um, fix or pill that's going to fix everything. So a lot of women definitely will have improvement in their sleep with estrogen therapy, even if they're not having hot flashes as well. I think they looked at that in the WHI and did find a sleep improvement with estrogen in the absence of vasomotor symptoms. So there can be a lot of extra benefits to using estrogen therapy for that. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that too, is that uh, when women are have a lot of hot flashes and night sweats, as we call them, the vasomotor symptoms, um, going on estrogen helps significantly. And as we know, it's a uh, it's a first line uh, treatment for um, vasomotor symptoms. And I know that, and you've probably seen it too, is that the new medication that came out that is non-hormonal, that helps with vasomotor symptoms. But from what I understand, it's pretty expensive. You have to watch the liver enzymes, I think, on that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting. It's always great to have something else in the toolbox, but it was there's a huge placebo effect in that, that study as well. So yeah. Um, I just did a podcast episode about it and uh, there was in the treatment group, they had about between two and three fewer hot flashes a night than the placebo group. So the placebo group had a pretty significant reduction of hot flashes to start with, but I mean, it's definitely good to have more things that we can treat women with. And there was some evidence that it might help with sleep, but it didn't reach statistical significance. So it'll be really interesting to see once women start using it, if we are starting to find other benefits associated with it. But I'm imagining it may take a while for some women to get on board with it, with the liver function monitoring that having to come in at three months, six months, nine months. And I don't know, I'm, I'm not always the f- first person to use something, but 
if somebody's really suffering and they can't use hormones, I think it's a good option for them. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Have you heard of using Paxil as well for um, vasomotor symptoms? I know that that was in the New England Journal of Medicine that they had recommended. I think it's like 10 milligrams of using Paxil for vasomotor. Have you seen that? Yeah, I have. I don't use a lot of Paxil because I always have concerns about weight gain with that. So I haven't really used it. I know it's approved as Brisdel. It was expensive in the past to use um, when it was branded, but I haven't really used it a ton. You know, in Colorado, I have a lot of patients that um, are kind of less is more. So a lot of my patients really try to do some holistic things and lifestyle changes and um, I think that's changing some that women are feeling more comfortable with hormones, but a lot of times my patients try to get through without other medications. And then sometimes by the time we talk about side effects of SSRIs, they may not be super interested in taking them, but. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you recommend then uh, for women going through menopause in terms of, you know, seeking out a practitioner or talking about, you know, their symptoms? A lot of times, I mean, so many women that I've recently spoken with say that, you know, they went and they saw their practitioner. And one of the women that I was talking to, she said that she was told that, um, you know, when she was experiencing heart palpitations, right? Mm. We know that that happens also with perimenopause. And she went and saw a cardiologist and she said, you know, is my heart okay? And he said, yeah, your heart is okay, but maybe not your brain. You know, uh, isn't that awful? That's awful. That's awful. Yes. And so dismissive and so <sighs> hurtful and, you know, completely not even understanding why she was there. Um, Another practitioner told me that she was, you know, she had, she had joint pain. She had, you know, so many symptoms, um, not the classic symptoms of perimenopause and she was being tested for everything and everything kept coming out negative and nobody could figure it out. And then finally she went and she spoke to a different practitioner who said, you know, all of the symptoms that you're having, which were, you know, like joint pain, her skin, her hair was falling out, all of those things. Um, you know, they said maybe it's perimenopause and maybe you need to go on some estrogen, right? So I think that a lot of women suffer silently through perimenopause because one, they don't know all the different types of symptoms that may occur. And two, they just don't have a physician that will actually listen to them. And three, it's somebody that actually feels comfortable prescribing hormones. Right. Yeah, that's hard. In fact, I saw a patient yesterday, um, uh, 49, who just had a cluster of symptoms, fatigue, and was having these brain fog moments. I mean, I certainly have those too, where I just can't find that word or you can't concentrate or focus on as well as you used to. And, you know, she's had a lot of stress in her life and she's had to go back to work and, um, she's in a leadership position and it's very stressful for her if she's in a meeting and she doesn't feel like she's on her A game and she can't function. And, you know, I think that's the other challenge with perimenopause is that our, these symptoms hit in our midlife, we're late thirties, forties, uh, most women, you know, a lot of women are working outside of the home. They're taking care of their kids. They might be taking care of, taking care of their parents. They're also starting to get more medical problems as well. And so these symptoms really hit, when there's so many different stressors in life. So that makes it challenging as well because you're having to balance all these tasks. It makes it challenging. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I hear I hear a lot of women with palpitations. I've had some patients, seems like they get more palpitations, PVCs around this time, they go and see cardiology and, um, you know, have had good luck with, with hormones. It's not the majority of women that I see this in, but it's just, it's tough because the symptoms are so varied. It's hard to know. So. Yeah. I think that really what it boils down to is that, you know, if you are at perimenopause, we know can, you know, last for like seven years or more, right. It can last a very long time. So, and, and the problem is, is that really uh, it can start as, as early as in your late thirties right? The perimenopause time period. Right. So, so if you are a woman that is experiencing, you know, hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, brain fog, I think is just absolutely awful. It is so tough, right? Like you're trying to focus, you're trying to talk, you're trying to give a speech or whatever. And all of a sudden you blank out and you're like, Oh my God, what was I just talking about? You know, I don't even remember. Um, I think that that is 
that for me actually was like one of the worst things before I started. I, I started hormones myself. Uh, I think that it's really tough because like you said, you know, you're in the peak of your career at work, you're, you know, managing so many different things, juggling, and then all of a sudden, you know, perimenopause hits and you're like, oh my God, what is this? Right? right. Str struggling to uh, make things work and um, trying not to take time off. And, but what we realize is that you really need to seek help and really need to go and see somebody for all these symptoms. And I think the other big one that, you know, just when you mentioned that about trying, and we were talking about trying to focus and all of that is I think a lot of women end up being diagnosed with ADD or ADHD around this time as well. And so I don't know if that's maybe tied into it as well. And that is another really common um, concern that I get from women in the office is just a heightened anxiety as well. So, you know, which probably feeds into the palpitations and all of that as well. But we know that anxiety can trigger hot flashes and vice versa. You get, get in a hot flash, then you're anxious about, do people see what's going on here? Or do they wonder what's going on with me? And so anxiety is a, is a big component as well too. So, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, and I think what's also important to know is that um, there's really no like blood test or salivary test. Right. And I think that's right. something that people, um, practitioners will prey on women and be like, oh, you need to get like salivary testing or you need to get like blood yes. testing, but there's really nothing that is going to tell you, I mean, outside of taking a look at, you know, FSH or LA just to see, you know, where they are, there's really no blood test that's going to tell yeah. you you're in perimenopause. It's, it's really based on clinical symptoms and what you're experiencing. And um, yeah. for, for women that are listening that don't know, you know, menopause is defined as a time period where you have no period for a whole year. So before you go through that transition of no period for a whole year, all the time before it where your periods are irregular, you may be having heavy bleeding, you may be going months without a bleed, you may be going every two weeks with a bleed, that's all perimenopause. And so it's really important to know kind of what's going on with your body and, you know, when is it time to be evaluated by your gynecologist? When do you need to have, let's say, a biopsy of the lining of the uterus? When is it a time for you to get, you know, tested? Maybe you have something going on with your thyroid. Maybe it's your prolactin, you know, whatever. Um, you know, that's why it's so important to have a gynecologist such as you, you know, there so that they can go to and make sure that there's nothing else going on. And that if it is perimenopause, you know, and the patient wants to go on hormone therapy, that they have a practitioner that feels comfortable with that. Yeah. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. I think that was part of the impetus to me really focusing on menopause and blogging and trying to get information out to women is because I got tired day in and day out of seeing these women coming in, having been to, you know, a hormone clinic or they go to another gynecologist or another office and try to get help for their symptoms. And they're not really counseled about what's going on. They aren't counseled about their different options, prescription, FDA approved prescription options. And they're put on pellets and they're spending hundreds of dollars and they're not necessarily getting the effects that they want. And that was just really frustrating to me. Um, because we just want to feel, we want to feel good. We're aging. We don't want to be tired. We've got a lot of responsibilities and we want help. And then when you go try to get help from someone and they don't help you, then of course you're going to look at supplements, clinics, you're going to listen to the radio ads. You're going to go try to get anybody to help you so you can feel better. And so, you know, that's really been, you know, my passion and I, you know, I hear about it multiple times a day and it just, it drives me crazy that women just don't know their other options. And it's not just pellets or random supplements and things like that. And um, yeah, I don't know. Right. I think, yeah, go ahead. It drives me crazy. No, I was going to say, it just that used to, it drives me crazy. So you get women in the office with testosterone levels of 300 and they're losing their hair and all this stuff. And really they just went in and wondered, why do I feel this way? I have hot flashes. I have night sweats and boom, they get a pellet and, you know, that was it. So. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you hundred percent. We know that, you know, pellets, the problem with pellets is that we don't know how much of the hormone, like say if the woman is getting a testosterone pellet, we just don't know how much 
she's getting in that pellet. There's no way to discontinue it. Once it's in, it's in. And, you know, all of those side effects, right? Like who's monitoring the level of testosterone that's in her body? Who's checking to check for the secondary sex characteristics like that male pattern balding, right? The acne, the the weight gain, the clitoromegaly, what happens then? A lot of those things are not reversible. That clitoromegaly is not reversible. And so then what happens once a woman has been on these pellets for so long, right? So that's that's definitely a problem. Um, the other problem is that uh, we know that you know testosterone can be good for women. It can help with libido, but we just have to know that it's a tenth of the dose of what would be prescribed for men. And that you have to know uh, who is a practitioner that knows how to prescribe that, right? And you also have to know as a patient what to look out for um, if you are on testosterone and uh, what are the side effects and um, what are, you know, when's the time to stop? Right. I mean, some days I think maybe I should get a pellet. I need some energy, et cetera. But and I just joke with people that, yeah, we want to feel better, but we want to do it in the right way that we know the long term effects and things like that. And, you know, that's why it's so important that someone sees a practitioner like a menopause specialist or starting with their gynecologist because you don't have to go do a menopause certification to be a specialist if you're treating women through perimenopause and menopause but you need to stay up on the latest evidence-based menopause medicine and menopause medicine is hard because there's no real playbook or algorithm and everybody is different um, but that's why it's important to find someone that feels comfortable with hormones feels comfortable with things that are outside of the box or off label, but doing them in a safe way, testosterone supplementation, if needed in the proper situation with the proper monitoring. And the, you know, a, a woman can go to the North American Menopause Society webpage, which is menopause.org and find a list of gynecologists and other practitioners that focus on menopause. So that can be a helpful resource. Right, right, absolutely. And I think that that is a great place to start. And definitely keeping that communication open with your gynecologist, with your healthcare provider, and making sure that, you know, you're being evaluated for the symptoms that you're experiencing, and that you go to somebody that doesn't dismiss your concerns. I think that's also one of the biggest things, right, is um, I just was speaking to a patient who said that um, she told her provider, her previous gynecologist, that she was having pain with sex and that she was getting tears in her vagina mm -hmm. and, um, you know, she didn't know what to do. And he told her, well, maybe you just need a different partner. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's comments uh. such as those that are really upsetting to us gynecologists who actually care for women and are really concerned about their health. Because we know that one, it's not in their head. And two, it's not that she needs a different partner. <laughs> Maybe she needs some vaginal estrogen that will prevent those tears that are happening in that vagina. And she has vaginal atrophy. And she knew it was, uh, you know, her tissue was really thin and she was asking for help. And instead he just dismissed it and made light of it, which is really, you know, upsetting. So, and I think that happens more often than not. So frustrating. I think a lot of women in the past have just sort of made it as an assumption that this is what it's like after menopause and it's normal and they don't realize that they don't have to put up with that. But I think a lot of women are hesitant to talk about it because they feel like it's private or they're not comfortable bringing it up. And that's so frustrating to get the the guts to bring it up and then be sh shut down and dismissed. And, you know, same thing with, with a lot of the other symptoms that can emerge after menopause, symptoms with bladder urgency and, um, you know, the vaginal dryness and things like that and sexual dysfunction. A lot of women are really hesitant to bring that up. And, you know, sometimes as doctors, we're so busy if we're trying to see a certain number of patients, you know, depending on the work situation, doc may not be asking about these things all the time, but we really need to be asking routinely about this because a woman's sexual health is very, very important. So... And I think there's a lot of good resources out there and a lot of good docs um, in gynecology and urology that are finally starting to talk about all these things. So, yeah, I think you bring up a very good point, which is that, you know, 
it's it's hard in a typical gynecology practice to spend that kind of time and energy with a patient and each patient, right? So if each patient has all of these detailed concerns, it's tough to get in the answers to all of their concerns within 15 minutes. I mean, that just isn't going to happen. And so I think that's why it almost is imperative to go to a gynecologist who focuses on menopause, perimenopause, and, you know, does hormone replacement and sexual medicine, because they can spend that time with you, right? Even if it's a half hour, at least those that half hour will be spent on discussing your specific complaints, and that they'll be able to spend that time and energy with you and try to come up with a solution that is helpful and, you know, fits the lifestyle that you have. So I think that that's really important to find that um, yeah. in a practitioner. And I think sometimes we feel bad making the patient come back to see how they're doing and try different things. But really, I think we need to hold them, it sounds bad, hold them accountable to a certain degree, because I know I'm going to be compliant with treatment and doing things. But sometimes if you get a treatment, I tell patients, hey, look, this is just one way, one place for us to start. And if it doesn't work, we go to plan B. If that doesn't work, we go to plan C. So I always feel frustrated and bad for the patient if they come back in the next year and they're still having that issue because they tried one thing and they didn't work, it didn't work. And then they just kind of let it drop. And, you know, certainly that's up to them, but really, you know, we need to hold their hand and make sure that they are you know, getting where they want to get. And I don't mean hold their hand in a, you know, deprecating way or anything like that, but really working as a team just to let them know, hey, if that right. doesn't work, that's not the only option. We've got lots of different things we can try because I don't want them to just give up and think, oh, this is just the way it's going to be for the rest of my life. So. Right. You know. Right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's so important to, to make sure that your patients have options and that they can get the treatments that they need. Um, so what are usually, what is the approach that you take for your patients when they go through perimenopause? What are the things that you're looking for? You know, what is kind of like the basic workup that you do when you have somebody that comes in with all these symptoms? Right. Um, you know, it certainly depends on their symptoms. If they, um, and just like you said, there's really no blood test for perimenopause. If everyone wants to check their hormones. And I tell them, look, they're, they're going to be in a normal range. You're still menstruating. So they're not necessarily going to change our treatment or anything like that. But if someone comes in and she's had really erratic periods or almost a year without a period, or a lot of women have the Mirena IUD for contraception and they don't get periods with that, then those are certain situations where I may check blood work just to try to figure out what's going on, especially if they're having some abnormal bleeding. I I don't want to miss a hyperplasia or precancer or cancer or anything like that. So that sometimes can inform how I'll work that patient up. Um, but usually we talk about different things like diet, kind of lifestyle interventions that they can try for some of their symptoms. So, you know, if they're really struggling with weight gain, decreasing portion size, increasing their protein, um, talk about supplements that might help some with the hot flashes and night sweats like magnesium and turmeric and you know, soybean supplementation, you know, there's small studies that show benefit with different things. And then I talk to them, there are some supplements that I feel are on the up and up. Most of the over the counter stuff, I don't feel like it works, but there are some supplements that do have studies where they look at their products against placebo and they look at safety and they follow women using their products. And so I may recommend those. And then we talk about hormones and you know, in the past, we used to really say, okay, we're going to prescribe hormones in someone that we know is menopausal. So it's like they have to suffer through these perimenopausal years, and then finally we'll help them with hormones and menopause. And really, you know, we don't do that anymore. So if I have someone in their her 40s, she's having classic perimenopause symptoms, I don't necessarily check blood work except maybe a thyroid and chemistries and things like that, just to rule out if anything else that's going on. If there's fatigue and other things that I'm worried about, I'll just make sure there's nothing else medically that goes, that looks like it's going on before I just say it's perimenopause. And then we talk about the diet and then exercise is always a good thing. Um, talk about the supplements. And then we talk about the non-hormonal treatments. So things like SSRIs or antidepressants or anti-anxiety medications that might help with the hot flashes and night sweats. And sometimes that's a good option for someone that's really struggling with anxiety or panic attacks. There are other medications like gabapentin, 
which is used for chronic pain and seizure disorders, but has also been shown to decrease hot flashes and night sweats. And then we talk about menopausal hormone therapy. So using a lower, a low dose of estrogen plus progesterone if they need it, if they still have a uterus to, and progesterone is used to protect the uterine lining from the estrogen because estrogen alone can cause uterine cancer. Um, then we talk about the risks and benefits of that. Also, a lot of women in the perimenopause don't realize that they can still get pregnant. And so if they need contraception and their menstrual cycles are bothersome, they're every 21 days, they're heavy. You know, sometimes they really come on with a vengeance in perimenopause and some women have difficulty leaving their house to go do things when they have their menstrual cycle. Then I'll talk to them about a low dose of an oral contraceptive pill that they could take continuously that might help with some of the hot flashes, night sweats, and then also help with the menstrual cycle as well, because the menopausal hormone therapy is not going to affect their cycle at all. So if their periods are terrible, they're still going to be terrible. So, yeah. so we just kind of talk about everything and figure out what we want to start with. That's great. That's great. Yeah, no, I, I like the fact that you, you know, do a more holistic approach and that you are not really focusing on the hormones, but you're we're going based on the patient's symptoms and then seeing what works for them and that you offer them, you know, I mean, I think hormones are great. Um, but definitely if there are patients that haven't contraindication to hormones or that they just don't feel comfortable and just are not ready for them, then definitely there are lots of other options out there for women and for their treatment and for their symptoms, um, outside of hormones. I think if they're that, motivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was say if they're motivated to try other things first. I think that's that's great. Um, you know, oh, brain yeah. fog. I just forgot what I was gonna say. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Uh, oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, I think I think one thing is for certain though is that the vaginal estrogen that should just be for life. I mean, that for yes, women, yes. Uh, regardless of, you know, women think that if they have breast cancer, that they cannot take vaginal estrogen. And that's not true. You know, I have a friend who is uh, a hematologist um, who works with women that have breast cancer, and she absolutely advocates for vaginal estrogen for those women uh, because they need it. And not only them, but most women that are perimenopausal and menopausal definitely will need some type of vaginal estrogen and that it's safe because it's local, it's not systemic, there's not tons of it. It's like a tiny, tiny little fraction of estrogen that you know goes to the surrounding tissue that goes to the vagina and it does not go and circulate throughout the whole body. So that's why that's safe. But, you know, it's important that women know that and understand and know that they have options. Yeah, I, yeah. I agree. And um, sometimes those doses that we use for women are so low that they actually yeah. need to use more of them. You know, some of those vaginal inserts that are 10 micrograms of, of estradiol or estrogen sometimes aren't even enough to treat some women. So... They, they really can be used by most women, of course, after discussion with the hematologist. But I, I definitely see a lot more hematologists getting on board with that. So that's really, really great. So, yeah, yeah. So, so important for women. So any uh, parting thoughts, Dr. Weber, that you'd want to let our listeners know? I mean, you know, they're listening to you. They love you. And so where can they go to find you and set up an appointment with you? Yeah, so I practice in a clinic in the Denver area, so it can be found online. And then I also have a website called healthiermenopause.com that has all my information there if they wanted to do a consultation. I'm only licensed um, in Colorado, and so if someone's in Colorado, we could do in-person or virtual through my clinic. And then if someone's out of state or they just want to do a, a non-medical consultation, then we can do that through the the website. I have contact pages there. And then I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. And my, I have a podcast called Gyno Bits there where I talk about perimenopause, menopause, vulvovaginal concerns and sexual health too. So it's amazing. 
All right. Well, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate your time and the insight that you offer to our viewers and our listeners. And while we are done here, it's been real and really intimate. And remember, this is not meant to be any type of medical advice. So if you're having any issues, if you are a woman experiencing perimenopause, menopause, uh, any of those symptoms or conditions, and you're going through that phase in your life, please be sure to see your healthcare provider, or at least find somebody that is not going to be dismissive of your symptoms, and will actually take the time to listen to you and listen to your concerns and offer you treatments that fit, fit your lifestyle. So until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. So thank you for listening to the podcast and make sure you leave us a review, share and like the podcast. And if you leave me a review, I'd love to shout you out on social media. So be sure that you share it with all your friends and thanks for listening.